You know, it is amazing how much we are driven by time. And I remember, I think it's been about five years ago, that I went on my first sabbatical <clears throat> ever in, uh, at that time, about 35 years of ministry. And one of the hardest things for me to adjust to was the fact that I didn't have to be conscious of the clock. I had been given orders that, uh, you know, I, I was not allowed to darken our church door. And bear in mind, a sabbatical is where they literally insist that you as a pastor go and get ministered to rather than ministering. So I wasn't allowed to even pull into the church parking lot. And if I did, they had people in the congregation that were going to call the district office, and I was going to get into trouble and whatever. And I, I remember that when I was on the sabbatical that, you know, waking up at my normal time, and I usually wake up around 5.30, quarter of 6. I don't always get up that early, but I wake up around that time. And realizing that, you know what, I don't have to look at the clock. I don't have to hurry up and jump up and take a shower and be somewhere, meet this person, do this, do that, whatever. And it was kind of nice for uh, about three days. And they told me it was a 30-day sabbatical. So you can, you can understand a little bit of the conflict. But I want to ask you today, what time is it? What time is it? What time is it in the life of every Christian, and what time is it as, in our lives as a church? Is it time that we recognize that time is growing short? Is it time that we recognize that when Jesus said, Behold, he comes as a thief in the night, no man knows the day or the hour in which he comes? Do we really believe that? I mean, I know it's easy to sit in a setting such as this and to nod our heads in agreement and whatever, but am I really living my life as though I expect that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment? And if so, am I concerned about my neighbor, about my coworker, about my classmate, about even maybe a family member who doesn't know Christ enough to invite them to come to church? Now, when I look around and I see empty seats, I don't know what you see when you look at one of these empty seats, but you know what I see? I see a soul that isn't here that needs to hear about Jesus. And that motivates me in a way to where, you know, it's not just a matter of, of getting numbers, but hey folks, let's be honest, numbers represent souls. They really do. And we're living in a day and an hour where people are slipping into eternity without Christ and I don't need to go into a long, uh, elaborate speech as to how the earth is and the world is getting worse. But if ever there was a time that we needed to get the gospel message out, it's this day and hour in which we live. Can you say amen? So today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to speak to you on the subject of what time is it? Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Romans 13. If you don't have your Bible, we have it here on the PowerPoint behind me. Very thankful for the media team that we have. They do an excellent job in helping us out with the PowerPoint and the Scriptures and whatever. But notice here in Romans 13, we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 14. Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And he says a very timely message. But if you don't remember anything else about the message today, make sure you pay attention to what Paul says. He says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, nor in lewdness and lust, nor in strife, and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Would you pray with me, please? Today, Lord, I once again humbly ask for your help in anointing my mind, anointing my lips, and helping us to be your spokesman and bringing forth the truth of your word. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would precede me and walk before me into this pulpit today. I pray for a fresh anointing. I ask that you would anoint every here of every individual that is here today. And Lord, allow our ears to hear the truth of your gospel and Lord, to motivate us and to be an inviter 
to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, inviting others, Lord, to come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Recognize out of all the things that you placed us on this earth to do, there is nothing that takes precedence over the matter of being an instrument that your Holy Spirit can anoint and use and being a vessel to lead someone to a saving knowledge of Christ. So today, Lord, I pray that we'll be equipped. I pray that we will be motivated as never before. And that we will get busy, Lord, in the upcoming two weeks that are between now and back to church Sunday, should you tarry. May we not wait till the 18th, but may we begin even today inviting people and being sensitive to your spirit that if the opportunity is there, that we will believe that your Holy Spirit will convict and people will come to know the Lord in the very near future. For this will give you praise and all of God's people said, Amen. What time is it? How many times a day are you asked by maybe a youngster, a co-worker, or maybe you even find yourself asking a co-worker, my watch band broke some time back, and I've not been able to find, I've, I've put on some weight, my wife is a good cook, and I've not been able to find a wristband for a watch that really feels comfortable around my wrist, and now when I put it on, it doesn't feel comfortable, so I rely on my cell phone, and sometimes I'm always uh, leaving my cell phone lying somewhere where I'm not. Anybody here ever have that problem besides me? And you go to see what time it is. There's no clock on the wall. You don't have a wristwatch anymore, and your cell phone is not handy. And so you'll turn to the individual beside of you and say, what time is it? Have you ever noticed how our lives are indeed driven by time? Time for work, as some of you found out here in the last week or two. Time for school again. Time for practice, appointments, deadlines, time to go to bed, etc. In fact, time is so important in our culture that most of us have multiple tech devices all linked by the same satellites to tell us exactly what time it is 24-7, no matter where we may go. So if we are so driven by time, why is it then so easy for 80% of Americans to hit the snooze button on Sunday morning when the alarm goes off, roll over, and go back to sleep. Notice that the Apostle Paul tells us here in our text that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And what I mean by that is not the fact that salvation is just now available. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is that I believe that Paul was referring to the return of Jesus Christ for his bride or for the church. That it's nearer than what we first believed. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read through the Gospels and I read through the Acts and even the Epistles and what have you, I never cease to be amazed at how the disciples and the early believers in the first century church believed that Jesus Christ was going to return during their lifetime. What has happened over the past 1900 years that even though we give lip service to the fact that we believe that Christ could very well return during our lifetime, we're not living our lives as though we do expect that this could be the very day that Christ returns. What's happened in our society? We have allowed ourselves to become so preoccupied by day-to-day -day life and by the things that really, when Christ returns, are not going to matter to this much in relationship to preparing for eternity, we need to understand that our salvation or our redemption is drawing nigh. That eastern sky at any time could part. That trumpet could sound. There could be a great shout. The dead in Christ could rise to meet him in the air. And those of us who are serving the Lord and are yet alive and remaining quicker than you can blink your eye are going to rise to meet the Lord. Friends, there is no second chances. I've had individuals tell me that, well, when all that takes place and I see the dead coming up out of their graves, then I'm going to ask Christ, you know, for forgiveness of my sins at that point. Friends, you're not going to have time. Today, today is the hour. Today is the day of salvation. It's high time to awake out of our spiritual slumber. Notice Paul continues in verse 12 by reminding us that the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In other words, we are to live our lives as though we are expecting that Christ would return. And I don't know about you, but when Christ returns, I want to be found doing the Lord's work and not asleep at the switch, whatever that may involve. When I read Paul's warning, 
for you and I as Christians to awake out of our slumber, I'm suddenly made aware of the need for myself and for you as well as a child of God to reevaluate why I even go to church. You know, we go to school to get an education so that we can make a living. We go to work to make money so that we can pay our bills. We go to the grocery store to buy food and to the beach to swim and to fish and, and to have fun in the ocean. But church, why go there? Well, I believe that when you look at the closing verses of Acts chapter 2, that it gives a short snapshot of what life was like in the early churches. Turn there with me if you have your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Notice what it says here in verses 41 through 47. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, that is Peter, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Well, let's take a moment to look closer at these verses. And as we do, I think we'll discover the real purpose of the church and why you and I should all be a part of it. When I look at these verses, the first thing that jumps out at me is this. The church gives us a place to belong. Can you say amen? The church gives us a place to belong. Notice what this passage says. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to fellowship and to the sharing in meals. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. You see, the church was kind of the hub around which people's lives revolved. I remember as a kid growing up in a little town of 500 up in the mountains of western Maryland, back in the 60s and the 70s and whatever, the center of our lives or activities or whatever was the church. It revolved around the church. There was always something that was going on, and as you well know, as a part of a membership here at HFA and, and an attender here at HFA, we have a lot of things that are going on. But there also are a lot of extracurricular activities that are available. Can you say amen? There's a lot of things. I mean, I've never seen a time in a society where we're being pulled in so many directions. So good to have my daughter Jennifer here, but I remember when Jen and Kirsten were still living at home, and you know they were involved in sports, and they were involved in drama, and they were involved in band, and they were involved in this, and they were involved in that, and whatever. And uh, you know, mom and dad played taxi cab driver until Jennifer finally got old enough to get her own driver's license, and then she was driving Kirsten around, and so on and so forth. When she went off to college, it came back again until Kirsten got old enough to be able to drive. But there's always something vying for our attention, is there not? And you find yourself pulled in so many different directions. But I ask you this, out of all the things that are vying for our attention, what really takes priority over our involvement in things that are going to prepare your life and mine and the lives of our children for eternity? Jesus gave these new believers a sense of community at a level that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. All of us need a place to belong, amen? All of us need a place to belong, to be a part of something that is bigger than ourselves. We have this longing to experience family and fellowship. However, as Americans, we are so poor at doing this. Recently, one of the guests on a network news program referred to America as a nation of strangers. I mean, stop and think about it. I'm not going to embarrass you this morning, but how many of you could tell me your neighbor to your left, their names. Your neighbor to your right, their names. Your neighbor behind you, their names. And the neighbor, perhaps, if you have across the street from you, their names. How many of you could tell me that? And again, I'm not asking for a show of hands. All I'm saying is this. There are so many people 
who don't even know it. I know when Bonnie and I were youth pastors up in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, we lived in an apartment complex. I could tell you the people who lived underneath of me loved their Mary Jane marijuana because we often would get headaches from the fumes floating up from the floor. But if you ask me what their names were, no, I had no idea. The person who lived to my left, I had no idea. The person to my right, we would say hi to each other, but we never took the time to introduce ourselves to one another. I was guilty of it. Now, I'm happy to tell you, since moving to Harrisonburg, I can tell you my neighbor's name to my left, to my right, and even the houses beside of them, across the street, and even down a couple of houses from there, and other places in the neighborhood. I've made it a point to get to know them. But what I'm pointing out is the fact that, you know, if we're not careful, it's so easy to isolate ourselves and get so caught up in the daily routine that we forget about the importance of being a light shining in a world of darkness and getting to know folks who perhaps do not know Christ as their Savior. You know, sadly, our American culture produces people who, are more closely, who more closely identify with characters on a weekly TV series than with their next-door neighbors. There are many analogies for a Christian disconnected from a church, but the most biblical picture is that of a child without a family, or another way of stating it, is an orphan. God doesn't want his children growing up in isolation from one another, so he created a spiritual family on earth for us. And guess what it's called? The church. The church. This fall, when you see a flock of geese heading south for the winter, Flying along in a V formation, you might be interested in knowing what science has discovered about why they fly that way. It has been discovered that as each bird flaps its wings, it creates uplift for the bird immediately following. By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew on its own. Think about that. It has increased 71% and how far they can go at any one time, as opposed to doing it on your own. Folks, to me, that simply says we need each other. We can accomplish more by working together than we can by individual effort. That's a good time to say amen. amen. Also, when a goose gets sick or gets wounded and falls out of formation, two other geese will immediately fall out of formation and follow him or her to help and protect them. They stay with them until they're either able to fly or until they die. It is only then that they will leave the goose to catch up with the other group. You know, Jesus gave us the church so that we can do the same thing by being supportive and by standing by one another when we're down and out. I cannot tell you how much it has meant to me in my life as a child of God that when I'm going through times of difficulty to have another brother or sister in the body of Christ to call me on the phone and tell me they're praying for me to come by my house and offer a word of encouragement, to get a card in the mail, some way, some form of communication of allowing me to know I'm not alone. And listen, friend, we are not an island unto ourselves. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how other people may look up to you. And in their eyes, you may be a spiritual giant. I am telling you that even the greatest of spiritual giants in the word of God needed other people. Moses needed Aaron and Hur, did he not? To hold his arms up when they were battling against the Amalekites. As long as he held his arms up, Israel prevailed against them. But when he grew tired and weary and his arms came down, the Amalekites prevailed against Israel. So Aaron stood on one side, Hur stood on the other side. They held his arms up, and as long as Moses' arms were held up, they experienced victory. I submit to you today, we need each other to hold one another's arms up in victory and not allow them to hang down in defeat. Satan is an isolationist. He loves to isolate us. He loves to get us off by ourselves. It's an old analogy, but it rings true. You think of a burning fire. You know, when it's there and the logs are all together, then they're on fire. I mean, you've got a rip-roaring fire, and sometimes it's so hot you have to move back from it. I've been at bonfires that are so hot you can't stand within 10 or 15 feet of it. I mean, the heat off of it is just so intense. My uncle that I have, he loves to burn fires that just drive you away from it, and you're trying to do a wiener roast, and you can't even get close enough to the fire to put your hot dog in there, you know, to, to get it roasted or whatever. I mean, he's notorious for that. But if you reach into that burning bonfire and pull out a branch or pull out an ember and you lay it off by itself, guess what happens over a period of time? It goes out. 
But when you pick up that same ember that is going out and you put it back into the fire, guess what? It reignites. Friend, I'm telling you today, there is strength in number, and God has created the church for a place for you and I to belong. The second thing that I discover when I read this passage of Scripture is that the church gives us an opportunity to praise God. Not only does it give me a place to belong, but it also gives me an opportunity to praise and to worship the Lord. Notice here in verses 46 and 7 of Acts 2, it says, They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. Now, hang on to your hats for a moment because I'm going to make a very profound statement. And some of you may be shocked by this. Don't get mad, all right? Listen very carefully. Just in case no one has ever told you, it's not all about you. Now, I know that's probably a shock to some of you. And, you know, you thought that the world revolved around you and you thought that it was all about you. Bible tells me it's not. It's all about the Lord. Amen? It's all about the Lord. It's all about Jesus. Church gives you and I an opportunity to worship God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my friend, understand this morning that worship is far more than what goes on in a church building on any given Sunday morning. Worship should be a way of life for all of us. But the truth of, us, but the truth of the matter is most of us don't worship God on our own. Amen? Life is so busy. There's so many things that are going on that it's easy to become distracted. All of life should be worship, but if we're, if we're honest with one another, it usually is not. But I'm thankful this morning that church gives you and I an opportunity for focused worship of Jesus Christ. David described his focus of worship when he said in Psalm 34, 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I don't know about you, but I love good worship. Amen? I love good worship. And I know Dwight does. I know as kids do. And, I, and you know, I, I get amazed at our little grandson, Killian. I mean, you'll, you'll forgive me. I mean, look, he's the most handsome, most, you know, I mean, he, he's the smartest. I mean, you know, he, he's just the best grandson that there ever was. For those of you who have grandsons, you know, your grandson runs a close second, but Killian's the best. All right, now that we have that established, let me move on. Killian... Killian, whenever he hears music, I mean, he gets into it. I mean, I, I can't even emulate it. As I told you before, I can't dance. But when he hears music, he's, and I'm not kidding. That's how he goes. His little legs are going to mile a minute. His arms are going to mile a minute. He's reaching out like this. His head is, you know, in time. And I, I mean, he loves music of any kind. And, you know, we should be the same way. We should become excited when we have an opportunity to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That doesn't mean, oh, I love you, Jesus. Oh, God's so good. Is anybody watching? Better put him down a little bit lower. Don't want anybody to see. You know, I, I don't want to get excited about the Lord. Now, listen. I know some of you men that are here. I've been with you. And I know that on opening day, whatever your team may be, you know, you're not going to bump each other and say, hey, I know we've got, <clears throat> I don't know if I should say this or not, I don't believe, well, I guess I can use the C word in church. How about those cowboys? <laughs> you know? And I know we've got some of you that are, well, can I use the R word in church? Redskin fans. And I know we've got some, well, here's another C word, Cleveland fans. And we've got some Miami fans. And we've got, well, those of us who really know what team to root for are Steeler fans, you know. But the point that I'm making is this. I can promise you on October 2nd, thanks to your generosity, when Bonnie and I are there at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh watching the Steelers play, I can promise you that if the Steelers score a touchdown, I'm not going to just sit there and look at Bonnie and say, did you see that? You're going to see that terrible towel whipping around and 
so on and so forth, and this is not about football. But the point that I'm making is this. If I can get excited about football, don't you think we should get excited about our God? Amen? Amen? I mean, to praise Him, to worship Him, to exalt His name together. Come, magnify the Lord with me. Maybe football's not your thing, but I can promise you there's some things that you get excited about. Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. Hey, we're going to the mall. We're going to go shopping. I promise you, look at those ladies smiling right now. You know, you know, you get my point. I mean, there are things that excite you. Some of us, it's food. Some of us, you know, it's other things or whatever. Talking about the first day of bow season or, or fishing or whatever it may be. I mean, we get excited about those things, do we not? But it's time to get excited about the Lord. Do you know what it means to magnify something? It means to make it bigger, much like using a magnifying glass to read small print. Or do you remember in your biology class when the first time as a kid, I mean, I think it was like the third or fourth grade, and it wasn't biology, it was science then, but I remember using a microscope for the first time, and they took an eyedropper, and they had a, a drop of pond water, and they put it on, you know, one of those little glass slides, and they slid it underneath the microscope. Now, to the naked eye, it looked like just a drop of water, but when you put it underneath the microscope, amazingly, there was all kinds of life in that drop of water that was in there swimming around. And, and I mean, it was just fascinating to me to see it, you know, the, that all the activity of life that was taking place in that drop of water that was invisible to the naked eye. Well, that's what, happened, what happens when we magnify God. He becomes bigger in our hearts and in our lives. We find ourselves standing in awe of his beauty and, so, and splendor and saying, wow, I never saw that about the Lord before. Because, you know, it's only in worship and praise that God will really reveal himself to us. Why do I say that? Because Scripture tells me that God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen? Amen? When we praise and worship the Lord, look, you don't have to worship God the same way I do. I'm not asking you to raise your hands. I'm not asking you, you know, to, to be vocal and, and out loud or whatever. But I do encourage you that when we come together, that church provides us for a place where we can worship and praise God. You know, if you allow yourself to be truly immersed in worship, when we are worshiping together, you will not only feel God's presence in this place, but his presence will stay with you. You'll take it with you everywhere you go. You're going to find yourself driving down the road, and forgive me, I've got a bit of a cold this morning, but you know, you're going to find yourself, oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. You know, and, and some of the other, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not going to bore you with a hoarse voice this morning, but the point that I'm trying to make is this. I love praise and worship music. Yeah. There's nothing like it. And just go off to yourself. I mean, I was in my office the other day waiting for, for my wife to finish up late Friday evening, and I, and I just put on a Christian station, and I was in there with just my eyes shut and, and allowing my office to be filled with praise music. I mean, I had a God moment. God came down, and it was just wonderful praising and worshiping the Lord. Can you imagine driving down the road with praise music on, and, and you know, you're going to go meet with someone, and you're dreading it? Can you imagine the, the, the frame of mind you're going to be in when you've had that God moment before you step out of your car to go meet with them? Your attitude's going to be different, and it's going to show. Let me move on for the sake of time. The third thing that I discover here, backing up to verse 42, is the church teaches us spiritual maturity. In verse 42, we discover that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. In other words, they were committed to learning more about Jesus and striving to become more like him. My friend, we don't study the Bible so that we can sound smart in Sunday school, but rather we study the Bible so that through it, the Holy Spirit can change us and make you and I more like Jesus. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The Holy Spirit uses a variety of methods to lead us into Christ-likeness. And things varying from life circumstances and trials to shape our character, to hearing the Word of God being preached and challenging us to display the fruit of the Spirit in your daily dealings with people. Church definitely teaches us spiritual maturity. It teaches me to understand that there are certain things that I need to bring under control, that my Christian experience is not based on feelings or emotions, but rather it's based upon the truth of God's Word. And how many of you know that God's Word is never changing? 
It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. People try to convince us that, well, the Word of God doesn't say this and that. It doesn't really come out and say it. But you know what? I have found that in life, that whenever there are questions and whatever, it's amazing how many answers to life's questions can be found in this book. If you'll take time to study it, read it in context. Don't just pull a verse out at random, but read it in context. It's amazing how indeed the truth and the reality of the psalmist's word is in Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Isn't that what it says? You need instruction for life? Don't turn to man. Turn to the word of God and you'll find what you're looking for. There's much more I could say, but let me move on to my fourth and final point. Church also prepares us for opportunities of ministry. We find out that church gives us a place to belong. It also gives us an opportunity to praise God. It also teaches us spiritual maturity, but it also prepares us for opportunities of ministry. Notice in verses 43 through 45, it says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. While the apostles were out ministering to the sick, to the blind and crippled, other Christians were helping the poor. This points out to us another great reason that the church exists. Friends, we were placed on this earth to make a contribution. God designed each and every one of us to make a difference within our lives. God wants you and I to give something back. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we read, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Whether you realize it or not, God has a ministry for each of us. And the best place to discover and start fulfilling your ministry is in his church. Amen. I'm going to say that again. God has a ministry for each of us. And the best place to start and to begin to fulfill your ministry is in his church. If you love to cook, you have the opportunity to prepare meals for the shut-ins. I am so thankful for the women's ministries and Sister Diana Kaiser who helps to organize this and set it up. I mean, I, I love it when I, when I go into someone's house and I'm talking to them after they've had surgery or, or maybe there's been a tragedy in the family or whatever, and they're, they're so excited. I mean, after we've talked for a few minutes, I'm not kidding you, within five minutes they're telling me, I want you to know that I got a phone call from Diana Kaiser and she's already arranging meals to be brought in. That speaks highly of you. If you love to cook, what better way to share your, your talent or your gift than with those in the time of need? Maybe you're an individual that loves children, and you were probably meant to work with children in children's ministry, whether it's in the nursery, whether it's in children's church, whether it's in Sunday school. It may very well be in girls' club or rangers. We are in need of additional helpers and teachers. And we welcome your assistance. If this is something you enjoy doing, then recognize that God has given you that love and use that talent for the glory of God. Who better to help a recovering alcoholic than someone who's fought that demon and has been delivered and found freedom? If you've been through the tragedy of divorce, God can use you to comfort others who are experiencing the same heartbreak. They are every single week surrounded by people in need. It's a matter of finding out what the need is and then addressing it and ministering to it. The possibilities are limitless. But unfortunately, so are the excuses. If you've been saved, you're not involved in any ministry, what excuses are you using? You know, Abraham tried to use the excuse that he was too old to have a descendant. Moses used the excuse that he was a stutterer. Leah was unattractive. Gideon was poor. David had an adulterous affair and all kinds of family problems. Jeremiah, the great prophet, was depressed. Naomi was a widow. And the Samaritan woman had five failed marriages. But you know what really sticks out to me? In each of these cases, God used all of them. And he'll use you too, if you'll allow him. 
And church, we all have the same mission to share the good news of Jesus and a saving grace with the broken world. Maybe you will accomplish your mission by simply inviting people to church and letting them hear the good news there. You have a wonderful opportunity. We've got two weeks to invite minimum of five people to back to church Sunday on September 18th. I hope you've already started. I hope you're excited about it. Look, look, folks, I can invite folks. But statistics show that usually about one out of ten people that are invited are come. I see a lot of empty chairs here today. I know it's a holiday weekend. There's a lot of folks that are out of town and what have you. But I also am smart enough to know that we've got almost 200 chairs still here in storage that aren't in use. I think it would be great if on the September 18th Sunday, we have to go into that storage room and bring out chairs. I don't know about you, but I'll gladly give up my chair to someone else if there are not enough chairs. I would love to see this place packed with people standing around the walls. Because you and I have become so busy, we have caught the vision, we have understood the need that now is the time. What time is it? Now. Now is the time that you and I are inviting people to get back to church and see what the church has to offer. It's amazing. When people get excited for God, God honors that. In church, we see that the good news of the gospel is saving people from the broken state of sin in which they find themselves. The church in Jerusalem grew from 120 to 3,000 in just one day. By the fourth chapter of Acts, it had grown to 5,000. And by Acts chapter 6, there were so many that it was too many to count. Man, I'd love to have that problem. Terry, I would love to have so many people here that you would come up to me in the service and you'd say, Pastor, I'm sorry. I know we had at least this many, but you dismissed the service too soon. There were just too many people. I didn't get a chance to count them all. Friends, it's possible if you and I will get excited about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's time that you and I get excited about what Jesus Christ can do in the life of an individual. Remember what he did for you. Don't keep it to yourself, but share it with others and get excited about God first of all and then get excited about the church and the ministries that we have to offer in ministering to the needs of our community here at FHA. What made this possible? Because they knew they had a mission. And they were not content until they got it done. You'll forgive me. When I said that, I thought, (laughs) get her done. (laughs) We need to get her done. We've been asleep too long. We've been in a state of slumber too long. And I'm talking about the church in America, not just here at HFA. We've been asleep too long. Our salvation is nearer than what we first thought. It's time to awaken out of our slumber. Friends, I want you to understand, imagine the joy of greeting people in heaven whom you helped get there. Can you imagine people rushing up to you and embracing you and hugging you and saying, George, thank you. It's because of you that I'm in heaven today. If you'd never share with me the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord only knows where I would be. I wouldn't be here. George, thank you for doing that. Or CL, thank you. Thank you for witnessing to me on the job. You saw that I was lost. You see that I needed the Lord. You saw that I needed someone to tell me about Christ. And you were, you were concerned enough about me that you invited me to church. And oh, what a difference that day was. And because of that, we're gonna spend an eternity together in heaven. Or Teddy, You invited me when you were a student at HHS. Some of you that are in college, you invited me. And as a result of that, they're going to spend an eternity with you. Friends, you never know who you're going to touch, who you're going to impact. I want you to know it begins by one-on-one. We win them one at a time. The eternal salvation of a single individual is more important than anything else that we'll ever achieve in our lifetime. I close with this as our praise team makes their way. I believe it's imperative that you and I understand that church isn't just something that we attend, but rather it's something that we are. When you understand what it means not to just go to church, but to be the church, you discover life's true purpose. The church gives us a place to belong, an opportunity to praise God, how to mature spiritually and prepare us for opportunities of ministry. That's why we come to church. 
Now, maybe you've been out of a church for a while, and you feel like an outsider, and you want to get back into it. Maybe you've been coming to church your whole life, and you've missed what it's really all about. Or maybe you find yourself here this morning where you've never asked God for forgiveness of your sins, and you have yet to receive his gift of eternal life. In any case, this invitation is for you. You matter to God. And I want you to know, you matter to us. We care about you. It's not by happenstance that you find yourself in this service this morning. I remind you, now is the time to awake and to receive God's salvation because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So I ask you in closing, what time is it? Well, I believe it's time to come back to church. It's time to come back to church. Why? Because it gives me a place to belong. It gives me an opportunity to worship and to praise God. It gives me an opportunity as well to mature spiritually. And it also prepares me for opportunities of ministry. That's what church is all about. Church is not a building. Church is you. Church is me. And church is where we come to worship and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. May it always be about our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. And as long as we keep the focus on him, I believe the sky is the limit. I know some of you look at me like I'm a little bit of a daydreamer, not a realist. When I talk about this building being so packed that there's standing room only, I can't give you the date or the time, but I really honestly believe, Trevor, that before my tenureship of pastoring here at this church comes to a close, that it's going to be exactly that. I believe we're going to see this building packed to capacity. I believe that we're going to have to have televisions in the old fellowship hall and upstairs in the youth chapel for overflow crowds. I believe there's going to be people standing on the outside trying to get in. Why? Because I'm the pastor? No. <laughs> if, if I thought that for one minute, I can promise you it's never going to happen. But I'm telling you that if you and I will get excited about Jesus Christ, and if you and I will recognize that there's souls slipping into eternity without the Lord, if you and I will dare to get excited about what God is doing here at HFA to where we'll take ownership and we'll step up and we'll start inviting people to come, it's going to happen. I'm not going to be preaching to empty chairs anymore. There's going to be a person sitting there. There's going to be a soul that's exposed to the gospel. And oh, I know what my God can do. How do I know what my God can do? Because I know what he did for me. How about you? How about you? Bow your head with me in prayer, would you? Lord, today, help us to understand what time it is. It's time for us to awaken, God, out of our spiritual slumber. It's time for us to, have the, to, to break out of the mentality that will let Pastor Jeff or Pastor Trevor do it or the board members or Sunday school teachers or ministry directors or whatever. Let someone else do it. Don't bother me. But God, may we understand that every day we are surrounded by people that Pastor Jeff and Pastor Trevor and other leadership in the church aren't exposed to. They can influence their realm of contacts, but God, we are not randomly placed in our workplace, in our schools, in our neighborhoods. You have us there for a purpose. God, I pray that we will really indeed be in tune with your Holy Spirit, that when you nudge us, when you prompt us, that we'll be quick to look for an opportunity to invite people to church. God, you're such an awesome God. You're so long-suffering. You're so patient. You're so kind. You're not willing that any should perish that all would come to a saving knowledge of Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, friend, I never like to close out a service without giving opportunity. I pray that everybody within the sound of my voice this morning is a born-again believer. But if you don't know the Lord, if you've never asked Him for forgiveness of your sins, maybe you did at one time, but you've walked away. 
I want you to know something. The most important decision that you'll ever make, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. As Matt shared, you have no guarantee of tomorrow. You have no guarantee of your next breath. If your heart is not right with the Lord today, I'm not going to drag this out. I'm simply going to ask you, if you want to know Jesus, if you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Christ should return within the next five minutes, that heaven would be your eternal home, right now just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus. My heart's not right with God. I know I need to come back to the Lord. I've never known him, but I recognize my need of inviting him and asking him for forgiveness of my sins. If that's you, simply raise your hand that we might pray together with you. Anyone? Heavenly Father, you're the searcher of all hearts. My prayer is that there would be an individual here this morning who doesn't know you, that in the privacy of this moment they would call out upon the name of Jesus, asking for forgiveness of their sins. I pray, Lord, that as they do so, that you would wash away their every transgression, write their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, just give them the assurance of knowing that they're a child of God. Lord, that you love them. No sacrifice was too great for you to make on their behalf. I pray, God, that you'll help us as a church to wake up, to really catch a burden for the lost as never before. Lord, in these next two weeks, that we'll get busy inviting people to come out because now is the time, not just to come back to church, but to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. But how shall they hear if there's no messenger that goes forth? So, Lord, help us to be your spokesperson. Help us to be your feet. Help us, Lord, to be your hands, your voice, in making a difference in the world around us. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name and all of God's people said, amen.